It's 7 p.m. on Wednesday evening. It's time for the biggest non league football debate in the country. Search official BOTN and get involved with tonight's show. So, very good evening to you and welcome to tonight's show. As always, uh, jam packed with content for you between now and at 9 o'clock. Uh, this week saw the launch of Children's Mental Health Week. We'll be talking uh, all about how mental health. Uh, comes into football at all levels. Uh, we're also going to have a look at social media and fan interaction, how that all works and how you can get the best out of it in the next couple of hours. Uh, we've got plenty of our studio pundits uh, around to uh, have their say on the events. And of course, we'll have the non-league football quiz and plenty of other things for you to uh, get yourself into in the next two hours on the show. Get in touch on social media. It's official BOTN. Have your say. Get in touch on social media. Just search official BOTN. So very good evening. Welcome to the show. Plenty of uh, studio guests, as I said, to uh, run the rule over previews, reviews and all of our topics tonight. Delighted to say that Mick Sullivan uh, is here, Mark White and uh, Jody Brown and Harry Wheeler will be joining us uh, very shortly uh, as well. Very good evening to you, gentlemen. Evening. Hello, Ben. Good evening. So much to uh, talk about. First of all, I think we'll talk about some results last night. And what better place uh, to start, Jody, than your win over uh, Norwich United. Uh, great game and uh, back to winning ways. I'm sure you're very relieved. Yeah, it's been a bad January for us. Um, struggled with uh, the continuity in our squad. A lot of injuries and suspensions. Slowly the players are coming back. Uh, performances have improved over the last couple of weeks so I did feel it was coming and yeah we got a decent performance last night and and a very important three points. We talked about you on on the show last week we seem to talk about Haybridge every week and and the points difference between yourselves and top of the table what's the the goals at the moment do they change on a game by game basis because you have so many games in hand? Uh, Not for me Uh, supporters I think change their expectations every day uh, but for me, uh, if we could get anywhere near the playoffs, it would be great. Um, we stayed up on the last day last season, so just avoiding any of that um, sort of last day drama would be great. Uh, our cup, our cup runs have kind of distracted us from the league, which is well documented. Uh, we're pleased now to be out of the cups and just be able to focus on on, on back to back league games consistently and. I think now that players are returning from injury, we will we will become consistent, and maybe maybe when we get 30 games into the season, because we're still only 23 games in, when we get 30 games into the season, we can start assessing where we are and what we can achieve. But I saw a statistic today that we're one of only three clubs in the division that can still get to 100 points, so we're not a million miles off the pace. It is just a case of whether or not we can deal with a fixture backlog. A few football games around tonight, and Leatherhead take on. Burgess Hill Town big game Mick for Burgess Hill who obviously looking to avoid relegation it's tight at the bottom with just one place uh, for a relegation and, and Leatherhead it's been a strange old month for them because there's ten, there were 10 points on Saturday difference between Leatherhead and 11th place you'd think that the top 10 still have a chance in the playoffs but a defeat for them at the weekend has, has put them off the rails a little bit a, a little bit but I, I was still looking at myself like I think they're only 7 points off that sort of fist but I mean Mark's laughing behind me here but Basically, I, I believe they still do it. And I think that they'll t- probably nick the win against Burgess Hill tonight. As much as I love Travers and I'd love them to actually uh, get out of the position where they are. But I, I still feel it's all about tonight. If they uh, pick the three points up tonight, they're ready to be back on track. If they lose, then yeah, we know what consistency uh, can break up the, the mentality, winning, winning mentality. I'll get it out in a minute. So uh, yeah, I'm a bit nervous whether they are going to win tonight. We look at Mark, the Bostick Premier Division every week and there were some really good results at the weekend for all of the top five. I think it was only Dulwich that didn't win. And it's tight every week. And we're looking down to Leatherhead, as Mick says. Can you see any real change in the top positions? Those at the top and in the playoffs at the moment seem to be having a lot of momentum and winning each week. Yeah, I think that's the way the league's panning out. The, 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 top, uh, the top five or six, or maybe seven, you could argue, uh, are doing enough to stay there and they're benefiting by the fact that nobody else can string any kind of results together in behind them really so um, subject to that team there's normally one that comes with a late rattle 
it's a subject to, you know, that there not being that one or two teams. I think there won't be much change really in the playoffs this year um, with how it's panned out already. And I guess it's, uh, we, we talk about this every week and Harry's going to join us in a moment and we'll get his views on it. Great win for Billericay last night in the FA Trophy, representing the Bostic Leagues into the quarterfinals. They'll play Wildston and, they, and that was a tough game against Harrogate that they played over two, two games in the end. But can they really sustain the, the, the cup and the league? They, they're going to do it, Mick? <laughs> well, Harry are coming here and he say they will do. I mean, us... Uh, <laughs> neutrals will say they've got a big enough squad to do it and we can all have big enough squads I was speaking to Jody you can have big enough squads but breaking that continuity doesn't necessarily going to pick you up and keep winning your games but I think with their quality and experience that they've got as a bit of a backstop I think they will mull their way through and uh, I really hope they beat Wilson which is another old Bostic League uh, side that have done well this year Are we going to see the league wrapped up well before the final month for the season, you think, with the games in hand? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Bill Ricky are going to be the Boston Premier Champions, that's for sure. So, um, they're having a great season. And, um, you know, they've got the resources there to compete in both, unlike Jody's guys who have thrown everything at these, you know, two amazing cup runs. And uh, Bill Ricky, Harry and, and, and Glenn have had to deal with, I mean, I'd love to know how many replays they've had, in, but in both competitions, it's phenomenal. So, um what I would say is that actually not only have they got the resources in terms of the the amount of players they're able to bring in, but to be fair, they seem to have kept the ones I have got fit. I, I don't remember really barely a player at Billericay getting injured this year. I don't want to tempt fate for Harry, but you now which probably says something about the level of football they come from because the, when you sign these boys a league or two higher, they look after themselves, you know, and uh, that's uh, that's something that stands out for me. We'll say it before Harry gets here, but the, the achievement of Billericay, people will say. They've got the money, they've got the backing, they've got the quality players. But as Mark just said, to come through all the replays in the FA Cup and the FA Trophy, I think the FA Cup um, run was ev- the first three qualifying rounds they had to play replays. That That is a good achievement to, to be where they are in the league. No matter how much money you've got, some people say it doesn't matter about money, it's team spirit, it's this, that and the other. Still a great achievement. They're on course to do what they set out to do. Yeah, I think that's the important part of it, that they said they were going to do this and, and they're doing it. Um, they've backed themselves um, financially and with their recruitment and, and they're going to back it up with results. Uh, I, the toughest challenge they have is they're never the underdog. Like Every single game, I think, even when they're playing teams from a league above, they're still the big fish and teams want to beat them. So, uh, extremely tough to deal with mentally every single week uh, and they're doing it remarkably well but you know again it always sounds like you're detracting I'm not trying to detract they have got an exceptional squad and going back to your division at uh, the Bostic North do you, do you see any big changes I know what the one that you're going to hope for it is yourself but when you look at the top of the table it's still fairly close AFC Hornchurch of course have got quite a few points on uh, on everybody but apart from that um, I think Haringey Borough are a decent side just outside the playoffs. I think they could put a run together and and and, and break up the the current group. Um, we're a long, long way off of it at the moment, so we can't really speak about it. But I would probably say five of the top six will be in the top six. So there's a lot of teams fighting for the last place. And Mick, we look at the Bostic South as well. We mentioned last week on the show how close that is at the top of the table even closer than the north when you look at Lewis on 68 points and Corinthian Casuals in 6th place on 63 points the difference in that division especially with two going up automatically is you'd probably fancy yourself all the way down to Corinthian Casuals that you could still get in the top two most definitely yeah right the way down I mean I think that gap that 10 point gap now to Hive and with their don't get me wrong maybe Hive could bring a bit of momentum with the management change that might give them a little bit of uh, incentive to get on the fringes and someone could drop right out but unlikely I think they're all the top sides of where they should be the only side that I predicted that would be up there was South Park which is a bit frustrating for them I think their pitch and uh, has um, not helped them and they've had loads more injuries but worse they would have been up there and of course Hastings had they um had the manager in place that and the, and the team they've got now likely would be up there like have um challenge him did you just pick out Hastings and South Park at the beginning I'm just try, trying to get a, a no, handle no, on South your Park I did South Park I did but I was really impressed with watching Hastings the other week against South Park ironically and I thought cracking young side 
and uh, and their management team is really good. They talk sense. Plenty to talk about uh, on tonight's show and we're going to talk now our first topic of the evening uh, is uh, looking at mental health in football and t- this week saw uh, the launch of children's mental health week it's a new initiative uh, that's in- been introduced uh, this year for the first time ever and uh, want to start uh, the debate really by looking at it from a, a football view th- th- one of these subjects that often isn't spoken about as much as it, it should be and we look at it from a non-league perspective. It happens all the way across the game. But it is something that is certainly prevalent wherever you go and whichever club you're at. I'm sure somewhere you, you're, you're having to touch on the issues. Look, I've got a little story to say. You know, difficult for me to actually speak about this. But even myself had mental health issues. The fact that I, at, at times with my work stress and some of the managerial jobs that I've taken on in the past, I've put my heart and soul into it. It's cost me dearly on marriage and other stuff like that. I'd even taken depressants to get over that. So I've been there and done that and and know what it's about. But I've also seen, I've dealt with a player at a club that I've uh, been managing and uh, he had those uh, mental health issues. And basically um, we nursed him through and then uh, unbelievably one day when he was warming up before the game, he, he asked to pull us in the office and have a chat and he said, my head's all over the place. I go, I just can't play. I just can't play. And I was sort of like taken aback because he had been fine for many weeks previously. So I had to sort of like rush another player in out of the blue, ring him up and get him there. And then ironically, the, the player come back and sat with us in the second half. He went all the way home and then come all the way back and sat with us in the second half. So these, you know, mental illnesses, you know, an insight into mental illness is unbelievable. It's, a, it's, it's such a fantastic thing for everyone to be made aware of it because it's so prevalent right across football, right across supporters, everyone's affected by it I know we're talking about only the football element of it but but you know and I'm hoping that you know there are people out there if they need help that there are people at clubs that can actually point them in the right direction but also good managers that can manage it good some you know really interesting points to to kick off the debate and very open and honest uh, from yourself Mick and Mark this is you know, it's, it is one of those subjects that when you go around the clubs, if you get people to talk about it, it's, you always know somebody who's been through it or, or, or somebody who's been affected by this. Yeah, I mean, I know some really well-known players uh, in, in the Bostic Premier now that, uh, that are sufferers and have problems. And um, yeah, it is challenging, really, um, more than challenging. And... Um, because sometimes the old adage is, you know, get a football and take your mind off it. But of course, the, these things are way, way deeper than that. So um, the club ultimately and the manager, you know, does have a responsibility. But of course, sometimes people are, are big enough to confide in their management and, and say they've got a problem or two. Um, but being a, a young sport, not everybody, you know, some of the youngsters it won't always uh, say too much. So, you know, it's uh, important for managers to be wary. There's some really there's some really interesting facts on this that one in four people will experience a mental health problem uh, in any year. Over 10% of the population have had depression at any one time, and uh, long periods of living under stress can lead to that anxiety and depression, as well as uh, physical conditions such as heart diseases and and headaches and all sorts of things. So it's something that is in society as a whole. But Jody, in football, it, it's it probably more so. It's not talked about as much as the people that, that look at these things and try and help with these things would like? Yes, an egotistical world. So not many people are going to be brave enough to discuss it openly, I don't think. And I, I think you'll find a lot of people joke about it as well in in what they sort of feel is a, a banter type way where if you're suffering, you're not going to find it funny, are you? Where other people might. So it's a difficult one in a football dressing room. I understand why people don't speak about it. Um, on Mick's point I, I, about himself, I'd be surprised if any manager that has a decent length career hasn't gone through mental mental struggles. Um, I have. I'm, I'm sure it, it's on a continuum. You know how how what is mental health, and I think that's the education and the discussion is so important because you know not sleeping after a couple of bad results is, is that a mental health issue? Well, it probably is. Um, but then you can get to the point where you hear of people want to drive their car into brick walls and uh, and they don't want to come to football anymore and they don't want to go home after they lose and see their wife or their girlfriend or their kids and so the, the, 
education is the most important thing because I think there's a lot of us don't know where you know where the line's drawn of well that's just normal that you just feel that way but but then when you cross that line now it is a mental health issue and I think I think education on the on the subject is massively important and Mark is it is it greater now at all levels because of the exposure that you get from non-league upwards it, certainly in the Premier League the cameras the TV coverage uh, the newspapers the media everything that we do as well across non-league it, it's there for everybody to see it's it's so uh, in focus that it can it, it's natural that we probably have more issues of people feeling that pressure than perhaps we did years ago well I don't know I mean I think um, it's more so that it's just more exposed by the um, uh, the easy access to social media and the visibility um, across all kind of channels now, you know. I think that's why, um, um, you know, outside of sport, you know, um, youngsters, etc. cetera, um, it's so, such, so more visible um, with teenagers, etc. cetera now. Um, but I think certainly in football, um, yeah, 100%. I mean, I think what I would say is whilst it's more visible, so are the positive cases. I mean, um, you know, Aaron Lennon's been... Uh, well documented and there's been lots of uh, great things um, you can read up on and he's spoken out himself about it and, and that really does help when you get some of these senior pros speaking out about their problems and how to, how to overcome them so that that visibility with that does come you know communication which is good and Mick yeah, you, obviously the experience that, that you've told us about tonight and having somebody in the squad that's that's perhaps brought to your attention the issues that they're having do you think clubs are equipped well enough to deal with those things at this level probably not in all honesty I think you've got to rely clubs have to rely that they've got a good management team in tow and they can they can sense there's an issue with one or two with anyone within their club but particularly their players that they can see the sort of starting points of of that sort of issue happening and and pick up on it and good management is about pulling that guy and and, and having a conversation and support him uh, but he's all you, but you've got to pick up on the signs there you know there are signs and uh, if you're if, if you're aware of it you're you know people that have been through it will see those signs earlier than others but you know is seeing the signs and I'm not so sure every manager will see those signs and particularly young managers that have not seen enough in the game yet to see those elements but uh, you know will pick up on it and probably do their best as an older guy would do but it's uh, it's about picking up on those signs and his training may be needed but can, is it really feasibly possible or is it something that you need someone in your club to be trained up it's a very difficult thing if I'll be honest about it very difficult I don't know what the answers are to it being children's mental health week this week we wanted to link it uh, to football as best as we could and earlier on I was delighted to speak to Callum Best the son of the late great George Best who had off the field issues that everybody uh, was aware of and still uh, played through and was one of the uh, greatest players of his time it was a fascinating uh, chat I had earlier on uh, with Callum back of the net where it matters. Callum, Mental Health Awareness Week is such an important time to make people aware that this really can affect anybody. My old man used to say to me that uh, it didn't really matter what, what part of life you were from, whether you were a job, whether you were a janitor, whatever it may be, these kind of problems affect everybody from every walk of life. So it's, uh, it, it, it's, it might be tricky for some people to understand when you look at somebody like a professional footballer because you think they are living the dream and, and the lifestyle that they have is the ultimate goal and in very much ways it is because it is the dream for a lot of people but no matter if it's a f professional footballer or not they still can come from a place where mental health can affect them you know th whether it be problems at home whether it could be their own demons on the inside they had before they even became a professional footballer you know but for example my dad he had a he had, he had a problem at home with his mother being a a alcoholic which which i think in some ways led to his problems in life you know and i think a lot of people as well i'll use gaza as an example as well i think that sometimes professional footballers they have this great moment on the pitch and this this ultimate lifestyle that they love and when they can't have that anymore i affect them badly you know i think it's, i look at somebody like gaza who had had the dream on the pitch and as soon as he comes off he doesn't know where to turn so they start turning to the things that are going to affect their mental health badly whether it be drink whether it be 
you know, uh, drugs or whatever it may be. So it's, it's, it's a tricky one because it's the ultimate fantasy job for, for me and all the other young lads out there. But there's so much more going on behind the scenes that what they just have to portray to the people and to the media. I guess that's a little bit uh, why this week is so important because it is mm. that awareness, as you said, of people understanding that this can affect everybody, for, for especially, I guess, those that have, as you say, that lifestyle that everybody wants and the perception of maybe people on the outside of understanding how somebody who has so much can be yeah. affected by these problems. Well, I think that people, I think that, it's not easy for some it, – it, it's such a cliche because it, it, it is the case if you look at the lifestyle and you think, what could be better than that? And I agree because I sometimes look and go, God damn, I wish I was a professional footballer. I wish I grew up playing it because it's the ultimate career job. You think it's healthy. It pays well. The girls are interested. It's the game that you love. But always, like, what's going on behind the scenes? And but usually the player can't talk about what's going on behind the scenes because and nowadays, I think, well, in the old school days, in my dad's days, you couldn't talk about it because if you're a man's man, you don't discuss what's wrong. Yeah. My dad never used to show his emotions, never used to show any, any kind of sign of weakness. And, and that was very much the way back then. I think nowadays, I hope nowadays, I really preach this gospel. I talk about my experience of having an alcoholic parent to help other kids. Like I get social media, people hit me up all the time saying thank you for kind of preaching the word. Not that I'm some guru, but I just wanted to, I had a bit of a platform, whether it be social media or being in the public eye to express my thoughts and feelings to try, try to let other people know that there's places you can go to talk to people about it, whether it be miscellaneous, whether it be professional help. But uh, I think that nowadays, a lot of the players, they're kind of trained to say certain things to the camera or to the to the fans to let them know that everything's okay. It's got to be very monotone and very by the book when really there could be a lot more things going on, on the inside that they want to get out but don't really know how to express it. So I think my key message is let people know that if you've got something going on on the inside, you don't hold that in. You've got to talk about it. If you hold in those demons, it's really going to screw you up long term. Do you think enough is done in the game to support players and staff that are going through this? And I mean, education wise for, for those that are perhaps running football clubs and we're, we're a non-league football show. So we're looking at yeah. clubs that, that are run on much tighter budgets. But is the education there from people like the FA and, and different groups to, to, to really get the understanding from those that are running the football clubs? I don't really think it is. I mean, I think there, there could be wheels in motion. You know, you, you see a few players here and there. You see minimal talks about it. I know there are angles where people want to help and people are starting to discuss it more, but it really is not the biggest topic out there, is it? I'm sure we don't even know half the people that might be dealing with problems that that, that could be helped if it was a bigger issue. Because there's so much more stuff going on in the football world that like, I don't think the main focus is worrying about their well-being. It's about worrying if they play well in the pitch. You know what I mean? So I think there's a lot more things that could be done whether it is the FA or whatever boards are in, in charge that I, I just think the problem is is that it, a lot of men and, and guys aren't open to talk about it so they might not let people know that there's a problem there's one or two Premier League players I know over years that have brought it up and I think not because there was only one or two but because those are the maybe two, only one or two that had the the maybe confidence or something to talk about it I just think people should be they should be they should know it's okay to discuss it you know and I think there are different boards out there different programs that should be a lot more helpful to letting them know it's okay. And obviously this has been going on for, for, for years and years, but in the modern game now, even when we look at non-league level and the interest and the growth in that, but certainly all the way up to the Premier League, there's such exposure to, yeah. to young men and players going into the game with the TV deals and, and, and really no hiding place on the cameras. That, that almost um, accentuates this the risk of this. Well, oh, yeah, it turns out. I mean, it, although players do come from all walks of life, you got to imagine, you know, you, you can come from somewhere and all of a sudden you've got to act a certain way when you're like, hold on, I don't actually actually feel that way. It's going to mess with your head somehow. I mean, you're going to be thrilled to bits because you've got some great contracts going on and you're playing the game that you love. But if you've got any sort of demons going on inside that you don't know how to channel outwards or discuss and you're not really coached through that – I think in football, there should be just like they're trained to talk to cameras and to talk to fans and to perform on the pitch. They should be made sure that their emotional well-being is just as taken care of as well. And I think finally, just to, to relate it back to your experience, your dad mm. was probably one of the greatest players to have ever played the game. And, and for, mm. for somebody to be that talented and have that much exposure, perhaps yeah. you, you almost at the time, you wouldn't realize the, the, the kind of fame that somebody's going to get for, for, for playing the game. You can imagine my old man, 
from from Belfast, the Craigie Estate, some small place, you know what I mean, on a small island, comes over to the UK and it's he's and and uh, incredible. I'm so proud of him. I'm so blessed to be his son, and he was one of the greatest players ever. But there's a lot of pressure that comes with it, and people, I'm sure, at that point, don't want to hear what's going on at home, don't want to hear what's going on with his mom, or don't want to go hear, hear what's going on in his head. It's just get out there, best team perform, and. And, and even to this day, I, I love that lads love his quotes of drinking and shagging and all this stuff. But the bigger picture is, is that I lost my dad to those quotes in a way. So it's like, although it's something that I'm proud of and I can have a laugh about and sometimes it's like the, the darkness that came with it. I wish it was something that was more easy for him to talk about it in his time because it maybe would have helped him out and have him still be here now. And that's what we got to think now. That that was going on in the 60s and 70s. We're in 2018. Stuff's got to be more open to be able to talk about to help potential players not deal with the same thing. Back of the net, where it matters. Yeah, really fascinating interview uh, with Callum Best, of course, the son of the late, great George uh, Best. And uh, Mick, really honest there. You were looking at me as a, you were listening to that and really raw, honest, uh, you know, factual opinion here on the... Uh, difficult issue that we're trying to tackle yeah most definitely quite broad-minded in some of the things that he actually said uh, and it's great that he's you know that he's prepared to come on the show like this and and give his experiences of what he went through and um, what what's fundamental to me is the fact that hopefully those that are suffering out there in the non-league game that can approach their managers and I hope they've got managers they can approach on a one-to-one basis because I think that is part of the managerial job. I know some try to do it all. I don't think personally you can manage, coach and do everything. And I think man man management is a separate issue totally. And I think it's very, very instrumental that 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 person sticks to that guideline and it will help people that are going through stressful situations. And Mark, he's obviously been through, through a lot with his with his dad that's that played football and, and had those pressures of the you know the outsides and it's it was interesting to hear his opinion on it uh yeah well obviously what people always forget is that uh, there's always other people affected um sometimes you know kind of more so really especially when there's kids involved and from canon's point of view um his whole childhood was with, with, with the, his dad so um in terms of the issues and and, and everything else so um, but I think obviously across the, the, the wider spectrum, um, there's always a, a bigger network affected than just the individual. And, and that's important to remember. Plenty of other high profile examples. Recently, Aaron Lennon uh, received treatment for stress related illness after being uh, detained under the Mental Health Act. Former England uh, captain Rio Ferdinand recently discussed uh, his experience of grief after losing his wife Rebecca to cancer in a recent BBC documentary while former Burnley defender and ex-PFA chairman Clark Carlisle has spoken out about depression and that suicide in professional sport uh, as well. We're going to continue to talk about this as it is uh, Children's Mental Health Week this week. I'm going to say a very good evening, uh, first of all, before we continue, to uh, Harry Wheeler who's uh, joined us. Harry, good very good evening to you. First appearance for us uh, on the show. Uh, great to have you here. And after such a successful night... Uh, last night getting through to the quarterfinals of the FA Trophy you must be absolutely delighted yeah very pleased it was a tough tough game they're a brilliant side um, full time for a reason they're organised and we have to be at our best no doubt about that and thankfully uh, uh, it paid off at the end of the day and for you as well a month where you've uh, been voted the joint manager of the month alongside uh, Glenn must be pleased with that too yeah no it's nice um, look the players have a lot to do with it as well it's always a uh, you know, it's good to have good players and, you know, where we are there, it's a privileged place to be. But it's, it's, it's quite, when you win it a few times, it's kind of the pressure to make sure you keep it up and keep your standards high. And that's also what we face with the players. We have to keep them on a level all the time and make sure they're as, their standards are as high as possible, otherwise we'll slip up. We've had our, our thoughts on it and the guys here have as well. Talking about uh, Billerica, I think everybody in the room said that you're going to win the league. You've got a lot of <laughs> games in hand. But we also said that the credit has to go to you for, for achieving the quarter-final place in the FA Trophy as well as being top of the league at this stage because those might have been the targets at the beginning of the season but you've, you've still got to achieve that. Yeah, I mean the quarter-final ones, uh, we've played some good teams. Some, uh, I think we've played three higher than us now and it's you have to be organised for them. It's not just about then having the good players. When you get to play sides like last night, you have no complacency. You have to do your homework. You have to be relentless. We had them watch four or five times, you know. We worked relentlessly in training. We went up there on the Friday and trained up there. And um, if we hadn't done any of that, you know, we probably wouldn't have got the result we got because um, it was a tough game away there. So, 
it's it's a uh, it's a tough it's a tough way to do it, but it's nice to be where we are, and uh, it's just the games wrecking up now. So managing the squad's the most important part. One of the other points that the guys brought up was that you've had to do it by so many replays. What was your feeling on Saturday when you when you, you got another yet another replay in a cup competition? <laughs> um, it's, it's part of the norm now. I mean, it was it was relief in the end because I thought. I think it was an even game. I think they had more chances than us in that first one, and it was disappointing. You go in the lead, and you can see straight away that you know suddenly they were momentum was strong. So it was it was a relief by the end of it. We'd have taken it. Uh, we had one one and one probably in the last minute with Jake Robinson. You'd put your hat on, and we'd have won it three two. And you know, but we felt that was their chance uh, to beat us. And if they come back to us, you know, we we fancied ourselves without being complacent at all, um, just because of how hard we were working. And uh, luckily, you know, uh, the result came out. In a cup competition like the FA Trophy, do you set goals? Do you, you, are you thinking now we can we can go and win this? No, just by game by game, not at all. I think if you look ahead and you don't look at the next one, you'll get caught. Um, and you know, I go back to sort of the FA Cup and we draw an experience. And I think there was a few complacent bodies, and you know, we've made sure that's never been accepted since. Some people haven't been present since then, and uh, it's something that we don't we don't. So we make sure now that we stay, you know, game by game. We focus, we take every team as the best side we've played and we raise their game for each one and that's the way we've got to be because everyone else is going to raise their game for us. You've come at a brilliant time tonight because we're just about to do the non-league football quiz as we do each week. I think everybody's got a uh, pen and paper around the table. Harry, I think there's some next to you if you've, uh, if you've got some. Uh, this is the point where we're going to ask the questions and the guys in the studio will uh, try and see who is the uh, king of the table tonight for our non-league uh, football quiz. And uh, I've been assured it's a, it's a competitive one. It's a, it's a good one. Uh, so we'll see how we get on. This is the non-league football quiz. <coughs> okay, five questions. Official BOTN on social media. If you want to let us know uh, how you get on, let's get into the quiz. Question one. First question tonight. By what percent have Bostic League attendances increased when comparing January 2017 to January 2018? By what percent have Bostic League attendances increased uh, when you compare January 2017 to January 2018. We've got... No going to give us uh, like three answers to go for? Uh, yeah, I, I will give you three oh, answers fine. to go for. Okay. Uh, you can either go for 21%, 37% or 11%. Completely up to you. Can you repeat them again, please? The question or just the options? Just the options, please. Uh, I'll repeat the question just for you, Mick. What, by what percent of Bostic attendances, uh, league attendances, increased uh, since January last year, 2017 uh, to 2018? Uh, is it 21%, 11% or 37%? It's entirely up to you. Which one you choose, Mick? Question two. The draw for the semi-finals of uh, the Velocity Trophy, the League Cup, were made. Who have the holders at uh, Billericay Town uh, drawn? Can I just ask, <laughs> like... Is the is this question right? Oh. Is this um is this okay to ask? <laughs> you cannot be in this, please. You can't. You Do can't just, have Harry. Should we just this? give Harry the point now? Is that <laughs> okay? So the draw for the semi-finals of the League Cup was made, and and the question is tonight: Who have Bill and Ricky drawn? Can you Harry? tell us the other three that are in it? Uh, I'm not going to know. I've got given Harry any more clues. Uh, well, well, he could give us some more clues. If he's going to get it. You, you've got to help us, haven't you? Because he's got a head start. Mick, stop moaning. Right, Harry, uh, you better get this one. No pressure. OK, question three tonight. Uh, striker Josh Mayhew is set to break uh, the furlough non-league record for most goals in a season as he currently has scored 39 in 34 games. Uh, but for which Eastern Counties League Premier Division has he been uh, netting for? Um, you've got a choice tonight. It's uh, Felix Stowe and Walton United, Stowe Market Town or Haverhill Rovers. Uh, striker Josh Mayhew is set to break the furlough non-league record for most goals uh, in a season. Currently 39 in 34 games. Uh, which Eastern Counties League Premier Division as he side has been netting for? Felix Stowe and Walton <laughs> United, Stowe Market Town or Haverhill Rovers. Are you happy with the questions, Mark, tonight? Uh, Jake. Was Jake. Um, Jake. They're, they're slightly more difficult than normal, so... I don't rate mixed chances of getting <laughs> beating his record of one point. <laughs> what was B? Uh, the Stone Market Town, uh, Felix Stowe and Walton United, Stone Market Town or Haverhill Rovers. The three options for you. Felix Stowe top by a long way. There you go. Jody's giving giving clues of his own out now. 
Uh, the fourth question tonight. Hendon have recently strengthened their side with an attacking midfielder, uh, Anderson Pinto Noguera. Uh, but what nationality is the 23-year-old? Hendon have recently strengthened their side with attacking midfielder, Anderson Pinto Noguera. I think that's how you pronounce his uh, surname. But what nationality is he? Most importantly, he's 23 years old. That's your clue, Mick. Uh, out of three. Well, give us three countries then. Come on. <laughs> No, you just got to work it out yourself. I can only go with what's on the question sheet. Wow. And the fifth and final question on the non-league quiz tonight is, after a, a reduced fixture list due to the Builder Base FA Trophy, which side moved into pole position of the National League on Saturday? After a reduced fixture list due to the Builder Base FA Trophy, which side moved into pole position of the National League on Saturday? You got that one, Mick? So nah, does that mean who's it. top of the National League? It's another way of saying who's top of the National oh, League, yeah. Uh, I got a bit confused there. I knew who it was before Saturday. With that, with that second question, surely you could just give us the other three teams in that velocity. No. Because I know, I know who it would be then. No more teams, no more clues. Uh, let us know. Official BOTN on social media. We'll come back after this. You're listening to Back of the Net, powered by Promote UK. We're really good at what we do. Times are changing. We now live in a digital world where 9 out of 10 people use the internet to look for local goods and services. Whether in front of a computer at home or on a mobile phone on the go, people expect to find what they want, when they want, quickly and easily. The question is, can your business be found? At Promote UK, we specialise in getting local businesses found online. One highly affordable package will give your business a stunning mobile responsive website, which we guarantee to get to the first page of Google and keep it there. And we take care of everything. Copywriting, design, hosting. We even offer unlimited amends all year round for no extra charge. So, whilst you're busy focusing on your business, we're busy making sure it can be found online all year round. Start your Google Page One journey today with a free online health check by visiting PromoteUKLimited.com Promote UK. We're really good at what we we do. From Premiership to Playground, MH Goals has everything you need for an outstanding football match, including aluminium and steel football goals, nets, line marking machines, team shelters, boot wipers, and much more. Buy with confidence direct from the manufacturer with great prices available across our whole range of sports equipment. What's more, we offer fantastic discounts for all FA affiliated clubs. We pride ourselves on British manufacturing. We make all our football goals here in the UK. UK and conform to the latest British and European safety standards. So call MH Goals direct on 01502 711 298 or visit our online store at mhgoals.com. Are you a budding footballer sitting your GCSEs next summer wondering what to do next? Want to play football while studying for qualifications that will get you into university? Dorking Wanderers Football Club are now recruiting for their football academy for 2018-2019 based at their brand new state-of-the-art Meadowbank Stadium. You'll be playing in the National Conference Youth Alliance against the best clubs in the area each week as well as the prestigious FA Youth Cup. You'll be studying BTEC Level 3 qualifications equivalent to three A-levels alongside professional coaching from our UEFA qualified coaches. For information on trials and open evenings, visit dorkingwanderers.com forward slash academy or email academy at dorkingwanderers.com. Head to back of the net south.co.uk tomorrow morning for video highlights and full match reaction of today's games. Back to your favourite non-league football show, powered by Promote UK. We're really good at what we do. Back of the net, where it matters. Welcome back to the show tonight. We've just done the non-league football quiz. Everybody's uh, had their best go at the questions and we're about to uh, reveal uh, the answers tonight. The non-league football quiz. Question one. The first question this evening was, by what percent have Bostic League attendances increased when comparing January 2017 to January 2018? Gave you three options, uh, 21%, 11% or 37%. Let's start with Harry tonight. What did you get? I guess 21. It was a guess. Jody? 37. Mark? The 21. Sorry, the 21, yeah. And Mick? 21. 
And I can tell you that the answer was 11%. Uh, Overall attendances are 12.5% higher this season. In particular, uh, January was a booming month for the North Division as they saw the biggest attendances of the season so far. 514 witnessed AFC Sudbury against Bury Town and 398 watched Averley take on AFC Hornchurch. The answer, 11%. Uh, let us know if you got the answer. Uh, official BOTN across social media. Question two. This is the one that we do feel that Harry should probably get. Uh, the draw for the semi-finals of the Velocity Trophy, the League wrong. Cup, were made. Who have holders? Billericay Town drawn. Got it wrong. <laughs> he's got it wrong. It was yeah, Corinth- yeah he's got it wrong. It was Corinthians. Yeah. yeah. Corinthians. What did they do? I thought you said trophy. But he's put Worldstone. I thought you said trophy. Well done, so well well done. Joe. I like that. There's I know the answer. Yet. What's the answer on your actual sheet? Worldstone. Worldstone, but it's Corinthians. Yeah. I thought you said trophy. I thought you said trophy. I'm sorry, really. mate. You ain't going to get some stick for that. I'm oh, sorry. I've put Corinthians. Uh, we we'll just asked uh, producer Remy. Remy, does um, does Harry get the points if he's put Worldstone on his, his, his question <laughs> sheet? <laughs> Stop it, Remy. Come on. He's stop coming it. away no as well. No favouritism, please. No, he can't have it, no. I think um, it's fair to say that Wilston was the first answer. But yeah, over here, like not not in the studio, I thought, oh, he's got it. He's got it. It's Corinthian. Yeah. Um, confident. And then if, if Jodie didn't say then that actually he's written down Wilston, you would have you would have fooled me. So yeah, no points for Harry on, on that question. OK, Jodie, what did you get? It was a guess, but I got Corinthians. Yeah. Yeah. Mark? Yeah, I, I got Enfield Town for some reason. And Mick got Corinthian casuals. So you didn't even need the clues no, that you were going on about. Think about Mick. it really hard, really hard. <laughs> there we go. That's what the qu- that's what quiz. Is, out now. That's what a quiz is all about, though, Mick. Yeah, got, well, you know, okay. Think about point. the questions. Fair enough. Fair enough. Question three. Striker Josh Mayhew is set to break the furlough non-league record for most goals in a season. Currently, has scored 39 in 34 games. Uh, but for which Eastern Counties League Premier Division uh, side has he been netting for? Felix Stowe and Walton United, Stowe Market Town. Or have a Hill Rovers, Harry. What did you get? We put Stone Market Town. Jody. Stone Market. Mark. <laughs> Jody's throwing me off on one here. I put Felix. <laughs> <laughs> Mick, what did you get? Stone Market. Uh, the answer was Stone Market Town. The Eastern Counties Football League, currently known as the Furlough Shush Non-League, uh, is an English football league at uh, levels of nine and ten of the English Football League system. It currently contains clubs from Norfolk, Suffolk, uh, Northern Essex, and uh, Eastern Cambridgeshire, and is the feeder to Division One North of the Isthmian League. Just so you know, the best record uh, for the division is former Brentford striker uh, Matthew Metcalf, who scored fifty for Wrexham in the ninety-two. 93 campaign there you go if you ever uh, need a, if anything ever comes up in a pub quiz for that uh, then you've got the answer uh, manager Rick Andrews says that obviously his goal scoring has been nothing less than phenomenal at this level but I think Josh would be the first to acknowledge that he's surrounded by good players who are creating the chances for him three questions down uh, two more to go question four Hendon have recently strengthened their side with attacking midfielder Anderson Pinto Nogueira but what nationality is the 23 year old Harry uh, Portuguese, I put. Jody? Oh, right. I put Portuguese. Yeah, Mark? Yeah, I'm last this week. I'll put Ugandan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. Mick? I've gone Colombian. Right, okay. <laughs> Can we just check how many Ugandan and Colombian players uh, are in okay. the Bostic <laughs> Leagues? Because I'd, like I'd like to get the stats on that one. Pinto should have picked up that Pinto. Bit. Yeah, the fact there's a few famous Pintos uh, that have played for Portugal, and you would be right in saying that he's Portuguese. Oh. Uh, yeah. He's previously played for uh, Europa FC in Gibraltar. So uh, there we are. It's going to be interesting to see the scores at the end of this one. Last question. Question five. After a reduced fixture list due to the Builder Base FA Trophy, which side moved into pole position of the National League on Saturday, Harry? I'll put Macclesfield. Jody? Aldershot. Mark? Wrexham. And Mick? Aldershot. I think he's right. I can tell you the answer is Wrexham. Ah. Yeah. They had a 2 0 win over Geisley, level on plot points with uh, Macclesfield Town after playing one game more. Only three other league games took place on Saturday. Uh, AFC filed to Eastley uh, to Torquay, beat Barrow 3 1, and Tranmere Rovers beat Ebbs Fleet United 3 0. That's the end of our non league football quiz. Official BOTN across social media. Let us know what you got, and uh, Remy's going to reveal uh, the order of the finish tonight. Wow, so I'd expect these sort of scores to come in if we had Pete or um, Anthony on the panel tonight because they seem to, to be the ones that, that struggle with this non-league quiz. But um, in joint bottom tonight, we've got Mick and Mark. Um, and then in second place, we've got Harry. And then leading the way, we've got Jodie, who got three out of five. 
Okay. Well, well Jody. Pleased with that. Big win for. Well, uh, it's been a while since Jody. I've won. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Harry, two and eight, two and nine. Not a bad effort considering you, you didn't get the one about your own team. I think it's heard the word trophy and I thought, yeah, that's what's been on my mind. So, <laughs> so many competitions. Missed out the velocity part. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a good point actually that you make. You, you, you're yeah. still in the velocity trophy. How are the fixtures looking between now and the end of the season? Or Dan, I ask. Um, tough but uh, you know we're uh, privileged we're, we've got a squad to deal with it it's just a bit of rotation now and trying to be clever um, but then getting to league games we can't rotate that much because we're not that complacent so it's trying to find a balance um, we play tomorrow play Saturday we play Monday we play Wednesday we play Saturday and I think that continues for a few weeks so uh, we just got to manage it and manage the fatigue and when players are feeling stuff we have to rest them and leave them out this week is the start of Children's Mental Health Week and we thought it was a good opportunity to explore mental health uh, in football. We're going to continue uh, that topic uh, right now and Harry has, uh, has joined us. We'll get your, your thoughts on this. The turnover uh, in managers is notoriously high uh, across all leagues now and players as well, obviously uh, moving clubs. The, the level of coverage across all the leagues from the Premier League down makes it a really stress stressful job. You're in a good as position as anybody to uh, tell us about that this season with the expectations at Billericay. Is enough done to educate people on mental health in football? Um, no, I wouldn't say so. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of clubs that try and do their bit now and there's a lot of awareness days and uh, parts of that, but it's a massive, <coughs> it's a massive thing. And I think it's such a, normally a boisterous sort of environment around football that it, it's, uh, it's something that people probably don't feel they can speak about. Um, but no, I would say not enough done, but I'd say there's a lot more done than there was the year before and previously. So, you know, progress is being made, definitely, in my opinion. I'll ask you first, Harry, as a manager, are you, are you, do you feel that pressure when you're not winning and results aren't going your way? Do you, can you avoid taking that home with you? Is, does that overtake you? overcome you in your in your life as well as the football side of it yeah last season uh last season i think uh, you know well well and we didn't win a game till november uh and then we took over st norman's was the season before and it was the same had a slight struggle and then we finished brilliantly and got up right up there but uh it, of course it does it's like everywhere i know the different side of it now and you don't get that that much but i can't say i miss it <laughs> it's not a, it's not a thing that you uh you wish on people and I am quite you know from experiencing it myself as well I'm quite sympathetic with other managers and I don't get any enjoyment out of people you know going through those patches because it's not an easy thing to go through Can you deal with it? Is there, is there any way of, of dealing with it as a manager to, to be able to switch off and is it important to, to do something else in life and, and get away from it? Um, I think if you're uh, the type of manager that as a chairman speak, as, a, as, a, as a chairman you want to have in place then you know, i.e. You, you want to win and at all costs, etc. then you'll never get it off your mind. You know, you get beat on a Saturday, you'll find it hard to distract yourself until you plan a Tuesday. That's the fact of the matter. If you're the right type of manager, some managers aren't that bothered about it sometimes. Um, you know, managers that float about different clubs, etc. Um, but the ones worth their salt would be, uh, would, would find it hard. That's just in the DNA of a manager. You know, you're going to carry results Saturday to Tuesday, Tuesday to Saturday. That's the bottom line. Is that relationship between manager, chairman, owners of football clubs, integral to keeping your health at good levels? Yeah, I think it is. And I think very few chairmen really understand that they need to speak to their manager from time to time when things aren't going well and when things are going well. Um, people are quick to critique, but very, very rare do people ever give you a pat on the back. And I think that's quite important. Um, the, big, the biggest issue I think with this, with the mental health, it, it, with, with regards to management, is it is a bit like a drug management, like the highs and the lows. You be, you know, you get addicted to the adrenaline of whether you're going to win or lose, and uh, I guess like a drug, it, you know, you have massive downs and and you have massive highs, and very very hard to deal with, and that's why one of the reasons I brought in a assist, assistant manager recently who's uh, quite a bit older than myself to be able to help me with those type of things, not just to uh, help man-manage the players, but to man-manage me as well. Because, um, you know, I've got, I, I'm, I'm driven, like, like Mark speaks. I, I, I'm not gonna find it easy to sleep when I lose games and things like that. So you do need someone to be able to bounce off and someone to be able to reflect with. Uh, and sometimes that means talking in the, in the office or the bar until, one, two in the morning after a night game so that you can actually go home and gut it all off your chest. If you haven't got that, then I do think you you do risk getting 
getting depressed and getting down. I think so having someone to uh, speak to gives you some perspective sometimes because, uh, you know, when you lose, it's kind of hard to get out of that and all you see is what's just happened and the now and the negative stars. Should have done this, should have done that in the game, could have done this, you know. Why do you do that? I think when you somebody speak to someone, maybe sometimes even a manager that's outside of your club, you, get, you speak to them that you know is a bit more experienced and been around, they sometimes give you a perspective of how quickly it can change and you've got to remind yourself at times that it's, uh, football's, you know, very short and it can it can change quickly the next game you can have a totally different feeling and that's probably the way to sort of keep going with it really the results are easier to if I could sum it up my 19 years results are easier to handle than when you've got player issues but I think when you get uh, when you feel like you've got player issues and problems you know, they take some unravelling and they, and, and they can become stressful um, I think when you feel like the players are with you you're all together things aren't all together going to plan you can pretty quickly get back in the saddle get together and it's enjoyable you know, you're in it together. But I think I watched other managers, lots of friends of mine, and, you know, when they struggle with people issues, player issues, I think that's when it becomes really stressful, almost beyond their control at times, and that can be more stressful. But Mark, when you be in a more privileged position, being the owner and the manager, like us, Motley Crew, have to deal with a chairman at the back of us for our results. I mean, do you feel that you maybe don't, you didn't get that pressure as much as what, because you're the actual chairman. Well, I'd, I'd be honest, I don't know how people deal with it, if I'm honest. I, I'm not going to, you know, I was speaking to Frank Wilson last week, I, because it's up to every chairman. Some chairman, without being rude, are, are, are in charge of the club because they've they've bought the property and they've got the field next door and they probably don't know who else is in the league. They just look at the table and make a few judgments based on supporters. Others are two hands on, it's the opposite. What I would say, I think, it's a manager's responsibility um, when they take the job. Uh, to sit down with that chairman and say, right, listen, so um, you've given me the job, this is the budget, and I'm going to tell you where you can expect to, to finish. And if I'm finishing above that, then, you know, you're going to be my best mate. If I'm somewhere near that, you know, I'm doing my job. And if I'm below that, then, you know, I'll always expect you maybe to give me a shout and, and ask me how it's going to improve. I think there's definitely not clear enough boundaries set down with management and that's, that's it's, it's that initial True. conversation. Certainly when managers are desperate to get the job, you see, uh, they say all sorts of things and you know, that's the problem but that, that it can be nipped in the bud with the expectation levels before you go into a role you see in the irony is you see at all levels Premier League and you think blimey why have they sat that manager they've, you know, they, they've just got promoted from the championship they finished sixth last year eighth the year after and a slightly poor start you know so I think expectation levels being set is key for management when we talk about mental health in the game as well we, we touched on this a little bit earlier on uh, and I asked you the question, Mark, with dealing now with the social media and the media aspect, everything that we're doing at the moment, all the way up to the Premier League and the TV coverage, especially things like Twitter, it, does that not make it 10 times harder to manage your feelings, emotions and, and stress levels when there almost is at some times no escape in it? I think, that, I think it does if you, if you read it. Um, there's a big thing about, you know, I don't, you know, I have it, and it's good information tool. And I think you can uh, you can open yourself up to as much as you wanna. And if you wanna bring it all in, you've got to be prepared. There's going to be things you don't wanna hear and don't wanna see. And some people's eyes, you'll never do anything right. You can you can be winning everything. It doesn't matter. But I think it's so cliche, but people from experience, you sort of draw off them and they tell you, you don't read it. It's opinions, uh, you know, and it does it does make it worse. And so the answer to your question is, yeah, it makes it ten times worse if you get involved in it. And your joint manager and mm. co-owner of the club is somebody who does spend a lot of time <laughs> on social media and and you can sometimes feel when you when you read those tweets that he's fairly stressed about that is that a situation that you would say well actually I'm going to take myself away from it completely 100% I think we're the opposite in it I don't read it and if I do I don't answer back I don't have anything it's not my not of interest to me he's the opposite um, but again I say you know when I draw on experience stuff you know he might be older than me but he's done this is his first year and this is my 11th yeah. so regardless yeah. of age so um, you know, I try, I do, and he's, he listens, and I do try and reel him in from it. And at times he does it, and then he sort of comes back at him again. You know, and he'll learn, he'll, he'll learn through it as he goes on, and he knows himself. But yeah, we, he is vocal with it, and it does all it does is create you know more problems. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I, you know, I, I can see why Glenn does it 100 percent because I think um, he's uh, he's integral, putting his money, and he's honest, and and he's in it for the right reasons, and he feels the need to defend himself, but. Um, as, as, as the club goes forward, Conference South Conference, that puts more of a monkey on the back of the club. Um, and the only way in football ever to answer people is just to keep lifting trophies and say nothing more, really. 
and 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 you know I, I hope for 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 Billy Ricky's sake because a bit like when AFC Wimbledon dropped down the leagues all those years ago and, and bought loads of interest to even the combined counties leagues back at the time. You know, uh, people investing in non-league football. You go to enough ground. We went to a Ryman South ground 18 months ago where we had to mark the pitch out before the game. Um, and they didn't even have a line marker. We had to do it with some white spray paint. Um, that was in the, in the Bostick South. So when you get a... I mean, I went down and done back of the net in the FA Cup game, Leatherhead, and you go down there and see pretty much what was a football league ground, football league support, and all that effort that goes into that, then it can only be applauded. And you're always going to get people that... I've got too much to say, so you just you just ignore it. No, it's, it's it's not good noise. What about players De- dealing with players and trying to manage their stress levels and and their mental side of the game? Is it is it a case of Jody? You'd say to the players that you you know don't don't get on social media because it's it's going to affect your game pre-game after the game. It's part of modern culture. I don't think you can tell people not to go on social media. And Harry makes the point of not reading it, but even that's very difficult. And I think if everyone's honest, you do look at it, how much you react to it. It's, it's very hard when it, a notification comes to your phone. Like Harry does exceptionally well if he doesn't read it at all. Um, but you read it, and, and, and obviously the subject tonight is mental health. Um, if you're in the low place, then it's going to affect you. If you're winning every week, it's not going to affect you. I, I can bat away any criticism when I'm top of the league or in the FA Cup first round, breaking records. It's very, very easy. But I was well in manager and uh, didn't win a game whilst I was there. And, you know, I still believed in myself, but nobody else in the world believed in me. I was getting battered on social media every day, every single day by people that, you know, I, I was quoted as saying it in the interview and in the end it probably got me to sack. I, I said they're uneducated people. I didn't mean they're uneducated, but I was under stress. You know, I was under stress. We weren't winning games and I got these people tweeting me constantly and commenting on every word I say about a situation that I, I quite frankly couldn't control. It wasn't related to my coaching ability. It was related to the mess that the club was in. Um, but if you want to win games it affects you when you're not winning games and it affects you even more when you're getting what you feel is personal criticism, not just, oh, we lost today. You're an idiot. You're this, you, you know, start commenting on your appearance and, you know, it's it's, just, it's ridiculous. And when I knew about tonight being on the mental health, I, w- I wanted to bring it up. There is like this unwritten rule in football that supporters can say and do whatever they want and you're just not allowed to react. I think that's complete nonsense, yeah. you know, I earn about 50p an hour as Haybridge manager for what I put in and I'll get some fool standing by my dugout calling me every name under the sun and if I turn around and go shut up people say oh Jody just leave it don't say anything and it's that's just nonsense why why should I be battered constantly by imbeciles and and you know I say it on the radio now it's, it's what they are I would never pay 10 pound to go and just abuse someone and there's a lot of people in non-league that do it and I don't understand this unwritten rule of why you, as a football manager or a football player, can be subjected to unreasonable abuse and not react. You know, like the Patrice everything, he kicked someone and he gets banned. He, you know, he gets a, a, a long ban from UA for football. Well, what was the guy saying to him to make him do it? Does he get banned? Is he, is he banned from stadiums? It's no wonder people struggle with mental health in football because we're just open... It, all the way down to the level I'm at we're just open to so much abuse and criticism it's, it's beyond reasonable we're going to talk more about this because the next topic tonight is about social media and, and the way that we use it uh, one final thing that I wanted to bring up on this uh, for, for mental health in football is the contracts now obviously uh, the, so much good comes out of certain stresses and um, football is an, in- an inclusion game it brings everybody together but when you're a player it, you almost and a manager you having to accept a certain level of stress because you're only get it's not like another walk of life. You may only get a one year contract, a two year contract. And at all levels of the game, perhaps the way the industry is, certainly if you're full time, that you have to consider where your next contract and where your next pound is coming from. Um, yep. Um yeah, I mean from a management point of view, I agree with what Jody says entirely. Um and um in terms of the kind of physical stuff on a match day I would argue it's way worse in non-league than it would be for a manager above that because you don't hear it. All you hear is a hum, you know, and, uh, and the occasional song in a bigger crowd. 
but I've been at grounds recently when you hear every single word on and off the pitch and behind the dugout. I mean, I would say probably this year half a dozen times people have actually ventured around between the dugouts just to stand there, just to say what they want to say. Um, and, and I've actually, as chairman, you know, because similar to Jody, like I said, we, we've got a part football background, so we're not, you know, we don't keep quiet. And, um, and I always make the point that these clubs have got a responsibility at this level to control their supporters. They know the difference between passionate supporters and ones that just go to the same place every week and say the same thing, and it should be dealt with. Um, but contracts uh, and, and players and, and management, yeah, will always cause uh, stresses. But social media-wise, it's just negative time spent, and I, and I wouldn't go anywhere near it. I'd spend that time watching a video of the match or whatever it might be because that, 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 that's what you need to do. So much to talk about on this subject. We've almost opened up a couple of new subjects on their own and we'll talk more about that as we talk about social media in the second half of the show. Lots more uh, to come. We're also going to play uh, Super Sub tonight and uh, preview all of the games across the Bostic League at the weekend. We'll be back after this. <laughs> You're listening to Back of the Net, powered by Promote UK. We're really good at what we do. Times are changing. We now live in a digital world where 9 out of 10 people use the internet to look for local goods and services. Whether in front of a computer at home or on a mobile phone on the go, people expect to find what they want, when they want, quickly and easily. The question is, can your business be found? At Promote UK, we specialise in getting local businesses found online. One highly affordable package will give your business a stunning mobile responsive website, which we guarantee to get to the first page of Google and keep it there. And we take care of everything. Copywriting, design, hosting. We even offer unlimited amends all year round for no extra charge. So, whilst you're busy focusing on your business, we're busy making sure it can be found online all year round. Start your Google Page One journey today with a free online health check by visiting PromoteUKLimited.com Promote UK. We're really good at what we we do. Are you looking for a little bit more than a good meal at a pub? The Half Moon is a hidden gem located in the picturesque village of Charlwood on the Surrey-Sussex borders. Proud of old traditions, this old English pub offers tasty fresh food with locally sourced ingredients, comfortable dining and traditional bar area, as well as a lovely garden for your enjoyment. Evening with friends or lunch with family, whatever the occasion, you can expect our friendly and welcoming staff to help. Half Moon Charlwood. Check out our Facebook page for upcoming events and live music. Need to refuel? Whether you're heading home or away, get ahead of the game and refuel at Dorking's Service Centre. Dorking's local retailer of quality BP fuel, cost of coffee and food to go. Find us at the traffic lights close to Dorking Halls or at DorkingServiceCentre.com. From Premiership to Playground, MH Goals has everything you need for an outstanding football match, including aluminium and steel football goals, nets, line marking machines, team shelters, boot wipers and much more. Buy with confidence direct from the manufacturer with great prices available across our whole range of sports equipment. What's more, we offer fantastic discounts for all FA affiliated clubs. We pride ourselves on British manufacturing. We make all our football goals here in the UK and conform to the latest British and European safety standards. So call MH Goals direct on 01502 711 298 or visit our online store at mhgoals.com. Head to back of the net south.co.uk tomorrow morning for video highlights and full match reaction of today's games. Back to your favourite non-league football show, powered by Promote UK. We're really good at what we do. Back of the net, where it matters. With all the latest news from across non-league football. Online at backofthenetsouth.co.uk And broadcasting live on YouTube, Twitter and Facebook. This is Back of the Net News. Here are your top stories at five past eight. Macclesfield Town's majority shareholder, Amir al Qadi, has issued a statement following the news the club's staff and players were not paid in January. The statement included an unreserved apology to everyone involved with the club and an acceptance that he has failed to do his job properly. Monday afternoon saw the FA Trophy fourth round draw. The standout ties see Leighton Orient face either Maidstone or Gateshead. 
Worldstone will travel to Billericay following their t- 3-2 victory over Harrogate last night. Hampton and Richmond Borough manager Alan Dowson has questioned the idea of managers of non-league clubs having five-year plans. Dowson, who has won promotions with all three of the clubs he has managed, claims there's no point looking further than a month ahead if he wants to avoid the sack. Sutton United manager Paul Doswell has blasted the Football League over its plans not to allow 3G pitches in the league structure. Promotion contenders Sutton and Bromley and Kent-based Maidstone United all operate on the artificial surfaces, which have been allowed in non-league's top flight since last season. Hereford club officials have confirmed they are investigating a number of incidents which occurred in the weekend game against Farnborough. The game saw smoke grenades thrown onto the field of play, seemingly from areas of the ground where Bulls fans were located. That's the latest. I'm Adam Wilmot. The second hour of the show, plenty uh, more to talk about this evening. We're going to delve into the use of uh, social media uh, in football. Uh, first, to bring up today of a few results, the games that are happening tonight. Leatherhead in the Bostic Premier Division, nil-nil at the moment with Burgess Hill Town. Massive game. Leatherhead currently uh, in tenth. And um, they have 48 points. They're looking uh, up towards the playoff. Burgess Hill are currently 24th in the division with 27 points. Uh, one point short of 23rd uh, placed Harlow Town. Three points adrift of 22nd place Tooting and Mitcham. So you can see at the bottom, really important game. Uh, they do, however, have uh, four games in hand. So Burgess Hill hoping to uh, kick off uh, those games in hand tonight against Leatherhead uh, with a win. It's a tough game for them. And uh, we'll continue to see what happens between now and nine o'clock. A game in the Bostic South between Thamesmead Town and VCD Athletic tonight. Thamesmead currently 13th in the Bostic South with 44 points. VCD are currently 18th uh, with 11 points fewer on 33. And Thamesmead have had three defeats in their last 10 games, whereas VCD have had seven. So both clubs are looking for an upturn uh, in form. The other game uh, tonight was due to take place in the Evo Stick uh, League First Division South. Uh, Lincoln United against Bashford United. Uh, that game has been uh, postponed. So there's a few games uh, in and around uh, non-league this evening. Plenty of uh, our panellists in the studio ready to uh, get their teeth into another debate. We've already talked about uh, mental health in football tonight. Of course, the start of Children's Mental Health Week, the first one uh, that's being done. Um, that was introduced uh, this week. We're going to talk right now about social media and fan engagement at non-league clubs. And we kind of did a little bit about that um, within the mental health subject. They did cross over tonight. It's a really big debate, the social media one. We've, we've started it. Um, the importance of social media in society has is, is, is certainly become prevalent in the, in the last 10 years. It's something that, Jody, you described earlier on that you, you can't avoid. It's there. But we've talked about a lot of the negatives on social media. You have to, to applaud the good things about it and how close it perhaps does bring people to, 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 to their clubs. Yeah, definitely. As a manager or a player, it gives you a voice to the supporters, doesn't it? So you can, you can build a culture through your social media, um, you know, because you can engage with your fans. Um, it, it gets retweeted and that means it engages with more of the population. And I, I do use it. I do use it and I try and use it in a positive way. But as a result, like Harry says, it does come with its neg- negative uh, impacts. And I haven't always dealt with them very well. I'm the sort of person who answers back, um, maybe a bit like Glenn Tamlin on, on different subjects. But um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm learning with experience that read it, but don't don't react to it but it's it's very difficult but you can't avoid it because it is just part of modern culture all your players are on it you can't ban players from being on it like and in 10 years time it you know it, it, there's 10 year olds on social media so in 10 years time it's just going to be a way of life everyone's going to be on it we've got to look at the positives for it and the way that it's perhaps grown the game at all levels um, one of the clubs that you could look at in the Football League at the moment that are getting real plaudits for the way they're using it, Bristol City. I don't know if any of you guys have seen yeah. the way Bristol City use social media. Their goal gifts have become a talking point uh, throughout football to, due to their uh, comedic value. Um, I'm sure we've all seen uh, what they're doing. Mick, have you seen it? No, I haven't. Funny okay. enough. Can you tell me about it? Have you seen it, Harry? I've seen it. I think, I think as I've sort of copied it in a way from what, from what I've been told. As I said, I don't look at them. But, um, Mick, you need yeah. a computer. I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> There's loads of positive. Non-league is bigger because of Twitter, in my opinion. Non-league is bigger because of that, the exposure of it, um, and then obviously you know because of that, fans come in. Some man- so there is a there is a gain from it a long way down the ladder. Uh, managers will gain sometimes more fans, you know, better budget, etc. But and I think non I think Twitter has helped with that in a way. 
um, from you know when there's non-league day or there's games you know there's Premier League teams playing away they try and get them down to your local club and I think it has helped I think a real important issue sorry to butt in is the exposure for players like we see all these yeah. players get moves into the football <laughs> league I don't think it would have happened before Twitter because now you've got players going oh, I lost 4-2 two today but I got my two goals yeah, great point. and uh, before you know it they're telling you on Twitter that they've got 30 goals this season and there's a lot of lazy scouting goes on in football <laughs> if you can just look on Twitter and see oh this boy is playing in step 5 in Kent he's got 40 yeah. goals this season you go and watch him well 10 years ago would me in Essex know anything about someone playing in step 5 in Kent probably not so I think it's give players great exposure and that's one of the reasons you see more people climbing the pyramid. Certainly clubs um, and players are starting to use it in, in the positive ways. And last week on this show, we had 12,000 people on Twitter alone view the show last Wednesday night. And it just shows you, Mark, the power that putting things on social media and the likes of Twitter really can have. And to share ideas and to, to share content from across the game at all levels was it not a pundit what pundits run was it is that what it was yeah um and it was dom that get the, the, the 11 dom of those were attributed to dom yeah he's a looker um i mean look commercially it's essential i think uh, as a chairman almost the number one recruit would be the social media man now if you wanted to grow attendances locally engage with local community we've seen it with uh, leatherhead um um, they really dipped um, in terms of their attendances for a couple of years and Alfie's come in there and, and done a great job and built his own little media team and um, at just 16 years old and um, you know we've seen how that's engaged their whole community uh, we, we've done a good job of it and um, equally now it's at the point where the club's not doing it it really stands out um, you know you get a Twitter to check the, you know the outcome of a game and notice it's not been updated from two days ago and and that really goes against the club. But I think commercially it's essential. Engaging with local sponsors, supporters, everybody. And Jody's point about players is, is an excellent point, unless it's your player that's scoring the goals. Yeah. <laughs> Does the, the likes of Twitter and Facebook mean the end to things such as fans' forums? Um, God. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, the forums that, that do exist now uh, tend to be much more specific than than the old-fashioned ones that, you know, kind of scoreline and then a load of comments about the game. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I don't know, for forums will exist, but they'll just be, they'll just drift off. I mean, they've drifted off already, so. I think, I think forums are for the ones that want to <laughs> batter you, but they don't want to be known who they are, and so they can hide behind it. I think yeah. that's for the, uh, the best keyboard warriors are probably on forums. Interestingly, one of the things for this show that, that we were looking to do, and we will do in the future, is set up a, a text number where people can text in. And, and to your point, <coughs> Harry, it's because there are still a lot of people that don't want to interact and, and their name to be known. And there are, there, you see people across uh, players, for example, that will use social media and players that won't and perhaps want to lead that life for a little bit more anonymous. And just to maybe send a text or get involved privately is something that still a lot of people prefer to do. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, correct. And I think also sometimes when you're yeah, looking to sign someone you don't want anyone to know and it pops up on a forum, it's probably someone from inside who don't want to know who they are who's deciding to release things. And that's happened in the past. And uh, I think, you know, I've I've known from experience, I won't name names, some, some managers that have, have lost their jobs and, you know, they're not happy with the club and they've bam it on forums under a different name and trying to bring things out. And, you know, it's a, it's another way of communication, but it's, it's not an exposed one. I don't think a forum grows a club in any way. I think it's just a, it's just a discussion. Negative, generally. Forums are, for exactly what Harry says, they're all under pseudo names and they're generally only on there to criticise people. Very rare you'll see a forum discussion about something positive. Mark, you mentioned that social media can have an effect on ticket sales. Does, does social media really help non-league clubs, especially, grow their footprint in, in local areas? Well, yeah, I mean, massively. I mean, it's, it's got to be the number one thing that any club's got to be doing. Um, because clubs under you know, when, when you're involved in a football club you just assume that people know what you're doing and, uh, and no one locally actually has a clue what you're doing I mean many many people move in, in and out of areas every single um, of year and we got to play a final last year and through social media I think we got what's it 1500 or something um, maybe more for the final and I was speaking to supporters last week who, who before the game who said you know we, uh, we saw it on the internet and we came to that final and, and we've been hooked ever since so I think it's a, an, an absolute essential um, tool now for non-league clubs because they don't get the exposure outside of really that social media. Newspapers now, print newspapers, not only are they not read anywhere near as much, but um, it's hard to get exposure. 
And we've got Adam who's sitting at the end of this table who's uh, who's tweeting out for us all night long, getting into interactions. So it just shows that it is the way now that people are, are communicating and obviously throughout football, even tonight's show, going out on the live on Twitter and Facebook as well. There are a few clubs to mention across the Bostic Leagues. The young media team at Leatherhead have uh, actively pursued engagement on all social media channels. Uh, they have 11.6 thousand followers across their three channels, a massive increase uh, since they introduced a few different things at the club. Uh, their average attendance has also gone up 15% from last season, now standing at 375. They've done an incredible job uh, down at Leatherhead to engage uh, more young people uh, in the game. Billericke, Twitter following of upwards of 20,000 people outside of the Bostic League are taking an interest due to, of course, the high profile uh, of the players coming into the club. Uh, their media team produces, as you mentioned, Harry, gifts similar to Bristol City uh, alongside the uh, general uh, Twitter uh, use and fan interaction. Just out of interest, have you had to do any gifts for uh, your social media? I was asked and I refused, so that's my... Uh, I don't... <laughs> Don't kind of get on that commercial side and um, you know interact with the players in that way and different things. Um, it's good for them to have that and it's a nice bit of fun for them. And do you know what we're talking about the stresses of it and that it's a bit of fun for them. And sometimes you got to be reminded why you started playing football and you played it, you know, to enjoy it. And if they can't, you know, do silly goal celebrations, silly things to sort of enjoy themselves and have a laugh at and banter with each other, it it would uh, be even a more of a serious place. So it's actually a good thing for teams to do if, if if they've got the capabilities to do it to kind of a relax the environment a little bit interestingly we did our research that bit ricky still uh, continue to hold fans forums um, with the last one in november to engage with all fans some may not use social media were you involved in that fans yeah forum? yeah yeah i was there yeah it was uh it was good uh it's cool, i can't say it's definitely one of the easier ones i've ever been to um there's been a lot harder ones and um it, it was good but it was a decent turnout and you know if people still have good comments and good things that you think do you know what you know, they are, they've been around a long time. Their experience will count for something and they, they give you some uh, good pointers sometimes. Last team to mention uh, in the Bostick Leagues, uh, Hendon. They announced the game against uh, Leiston will be live streamed on Facebook uh, by their media partners. Another uh, new initiative to try and engage uh, more people to try and increase the exposure uh, of, of the club. Uh, gives everybody the chance to have the game accessible to them. They're uh, doing really well on their social media following. We're going to come back to this subject. So much more uh, to talk about. Right now, though, we're going to turn our attentions uh, to Super Sub and our ever-growing leaderboard. And delighted to say that Ollie Robinson, uh, the Met Police defender, is going to join us uh, right now to have a go at Super Sub. Ollie, a very good evening to you. Hi, uh, good evening, guys. You all right? <laughs> yeah, very well, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Um, a a good season for you, a great season for you so far, chasing uh, promotion. Um, have you still got your eye firmly on the playoffs for the rest of the season? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We're coming into some good good form at the moment. Unfortunately, not beating Dulwich at the weekend, which I think we should have. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're flying at the moment and hopefully we can play, put in a good performance on Saturday against Billy Ricky Town. Your manager, Jim, always plays things down and says that you know it's it just takes it easy and says there were no real expectations at the beginning of the season did, did you did you believe that you could achieve promotion yeah i think um from last season we didn't have a very good run uh, we got some new players in and we did all believe um that we could go and push for playoffs i think yeah it's jim says those things to get us more pumped up and to go into the next game fighting and i think it does work for us and for you personally, what's the, the season been like? Yeah, yeah, I think it's been well. It's my first season in the uh, Bostic Prem last year. And I think this year I've I've come on leaps and bounds. Um, I've got the captain's armband at the moment. So, yeah, I just try and um, assess my performances after each game and trying to improve each each and every week. You're on here tonight to play Super Sub. Have you have you paid any attention to our leaderboard and the players that have been on before you? Yeah, yeah, I've uh, I've watched a few of the shows, so hopefully I can do a bit better. <laughs> um, yeah, but you never know. Sometimes I can choke. <laughs> Confident then ahead of uh, ahead of your yeah. F appearance. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you've not listened to this before, it sounds really simple. All you've got to do is substitute the correct answer uh, for any wrong answer. Just easy. Uh, on paper, it's really simple. But the pressure's on because we're going to put a clock on. And if you want to get to the top of the leaderboard, Corey Davidson last week, an absolutely magnificent effort, uh, 42 seconds. And if you want to avoid being 16th in the table, uh, you need to beat Jack Cawley, who took one minute and 54 seconds to do it. So somewhere in between uh, might be nice yeah. for you tonight, Ollie. 
Okay, let's go for it. <laughs> okay, we're going to uh, start the clock and your questions for Super Sub right now. What is the maximum number of substitutes a team can make in one match? Ten. Name two clubs that Harry Redknapp has managed. Man United and Stoke. The Bundesliga is the league in which country? England. Glad All Over by the Dave Clark Five is commonly associated to, associated to which football club? Man U. Finish the Bostic Premier team name, Metropolitan... United. Name a club who plays their home games at Wembley Stadium. Stoke. The grass area where footballs play a match is known as... A court. Name a club who predominantly play in blue. Man U. Name a fixture which would be classed as a London derby. Uh, Celtic v Rangers. Intimately is an aftershave by which former player? Uh, what was that? What was that? Intimately is an aftershave by which former player? Oh, uh, John Terry. Okay, stop the clock there. Let's uh, see how you did. How did you think you got on? Uh, yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. <laughs> let's, let's have a look. I don't know what the time will be. There were some uh, interesting answers. We're going to get the uh, time that you did it in and see where you fitted into the uh, leaderboards uh, right now. It is always a lot harder than you think it's going to be. Yeah, all you, got you to nearly do say, got me with the Met Police. <laughs> yeah, it was a tricky one. Uh, so let's go through some of your answers. Uh, the Bundesliga is a country in England. You said, of course, it was uh, Germany, the word that you need to avoid. Uh, finish the Bostic uh, Premier team name, uh, Metropolitan United. Um, it, 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 what it did, it's the easiest ones that do stump you. <laughs> name a club that plays at Wembley. You said Stoke. The grass area football player match on is known as a court. And uh, you said that John Terry uh, was the uh, aftershave man. It's, of course, David Beckham. And that uh, Celtic Rangers... Um, is not a London derby, certainly a derby. Uh, you did it in one minute and 12 seconds. Which, oh, that's, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. It's <laughs> not because it puts you in 14th. So, oh, okay. you know, you're, you're not the Jack Corleys of this world, <laughs> but maybe a little bit of room for improvement. Listen, I thanks. think it, it must be the concussion I got from the game on Saturday. Yeah, that's what I'd have blamed it on as well. Uh, listen, Ollie, thanks ever so much for joining us. Wish you all the best with uh, your race for promotion and the rest of the season. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, guys. We've got Danny Bracken, who's uh, on next. and going to be playing Super Sub after this. You're listening to Back of the Net, powered by Promote UK. We're really good at what we do. Times are changing. We now live in a digital world where 9 out of 10 people use the internet to look for local goods and services. Whether in front of a computer at home or on a mobile phone on the go, people expect to find what they want, when they want, quickly and easily. The question is, can your business be found? At Promote UK, we specialise in getting local businesses found online. One highly affordable package will give your business a stunning mobile responsive website, which we guarantee to get to the first page of Google and keep it there. And we take care of everything. Copywriting, design, hosting. We even offer unlimited amends all year round for no extra charge. So, whilst you're busy focusing on your business, we're busy making sure it can be found online all year round. Start your Google Page One journey today with a free online health check by visiting PromoteUKLimited.com Promote UK. We're really good at what we do. From Premiership to Playground, MH Goals has everything you need for an outstanding football match, including aluminium and steel football goals, nets, line marking machines, team shelters, boot wipers, and much more. Buy with confidence direct from the manufacturer with great prices available across our whole range of sports equipment. What's more, we offer fantastic discounts for all FA affiliated clubs. We pride ourselves on British manufacturing. We make all our football goals here in the UK and conform to the latest British and European safety standards. So call MH Goals direct on 01502 211 298 or visit our online store at mhgoals.com. 
Are you a budding footballer sitting your GCSEs next summer, wondering what to do next? Want to play football while studying for qualifications that will get you into university? Dorking Wanderers Football Club are now recruiting for their football academy for 2018-2019. Based at their brand new state-of-the-art Meadowbank Stadium, you'll be playing in the National Conference Youth Alliance against the best clubs in the area each week, as well as the prestigious FA Youth Cup. You'll be studying BTEC Level 3 qualifications equivalent to three A-levels alongside professional coaching from our UEFA qualified coaches. For information on trials and open evenings, visit dorkingwanderers.com forward slash academy or email academy at dorkingwanderers.com. Head to back of the net south.co.uk tomorrow morning for video highlights and full match reaction of today's games. Back to your favourite non-league football show, powered by Promote UK. We're really good at what we do. Back of the net, where it matters. So welcome back to the show tonight. Ollie Robinson has uh, just played super sub, got himself into 14th position, 1 minute and 12 seconds tonight. Delighted to say that Danny Bracken uh, from Corinthian Casuals uh, joins us now. Very good evening to you, Danny. Good evening. Did you uh, hear Ollie's go at super sub? Oh, I didn't. I didn't. I was just travelling home from work. Um, well, it did, did all right. You know, got it in one minute and twelve seconds. Uh, it's it's no, more difficult, right. I think, than uh, than most people realise when they come on. Before we get into Super Sub, uh, let's talk about your season. We mentioned Corinthian Casuals earlier, and we said that actually in the Bostic South, all the way down to yourselves, you'd probably still be thinking about automatic promotion. Yeah, that's certainly the aim that we're going for in the last twelve games. Um, yeah, we've obviously got a cup semi-final as well coming up and yeah, we're certainly targeting automatic promotion. We realise that we're going to have to win the majority of our games that are remaining and rely on a few of the top teams slipping up. But if we put pressure on to- towards the end, anything can happen. Obviously there last season as well, you've got the experience when you go into those playoffs and that might yeah. see-, see you through. Yeah, and uh, to be honest, we're always going to be the underdog, Corinthian Casuals. From the moment I joined, we're always the team that struggled in the league, being the only amateur team in the league. We should be at the bottom of the league every year. So to make the playoffs in the last three years, um, obviously the first year we got a point deduction on the last game, which cost us our place. Last year we lost on penalties, unfortunately, having deserved to win that final. And yeah, so it will stand us in good stead. But we're going being the underdogs if we have to go into the playoffs, but we're certainly targeting automatic promotion. I'm always more fascinated by asking this question to a goalkeeper. Do you set yourself targets at the beginning of the season? No, no. To, to, to win as many games as possible. Um, obviously, goalkeepers love clean sheets and you can just take a sense of pride in the amount of clean sheets you can keep. But as long as the team wins, that's all that matters, really. OK, let's get you uh, up for super sub. Um, you know the rules. You've got to substitute the correct answer uh, for any wrong answer, it does sound really simple. If you want to stay off the bottom of the leaderboard, you need to beat 1 minute and 54 seconds. If you want to go to the top, you need to beat 42 seconds. So let's right. get your time on the clock. Feeling confident? No. Okay. We'll give it a go. Let's give it a go. <laughs> uh, your time for Super Sub starts now. What is the maximum number of substitutes a team can make in one match? 12. Name two clubs that Harry Redknapp has managed. Liverpool and... Arsenal. The Bundesliga is a league in which country? Italy. Glad all over by the Dave Clark Five is commonly associated with which football club? Middlesbrough. Finish the Bostic Premier team name, Metropolitan? United. Name a club who plays their home games at Wembley Stadium? West Ham. The grass area where footballers play a match is known as? The Stadium. Name a club who predominantly play in blue? West Ham United. Intimately is an aftershave by which former player? Ronaldo. Name a fixture which would be classed as a London derby? Middlesbrough versus Sunderland. Stop the clock. There we go. That was a really good effort, I think. You uh, managed to get through them really quickly. How did you think you did? Well, as long as I'm at the top, I'll be happy. So you've got to beat 42 seconds that, that Corey Davison must say that that was set, the bar was set really high last week. It was a really, really good effort. We also had uh, Sam Mott on as well. It must have been a, something in the water last week because he got 46 seconds. If you want to win tonight's derby, you need to beat one minute and 12 seconds. That I'll take that. Ollie Robinson did it. It's kind of a derby, isn't it? Kind of a London Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, we'll take, yeah, yeah, we'll call it a derby. 
So we're just going to find out how you did and go through uh, a few of your answers to try and see if you can get yourself maybe even uh, into the top four. You did it in a very respectable 50 seconds, which oh. means you're joint fourth with Brandon Daly and Gareth Shedlink. So not a bad effort at all, considering there are 17 players in our leaderboard now. Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Made the playoffs. There you go. Exactly. Maybe that's a good sign. Hopefully it is. <laughs> um, a few of your answers. Uh, you said that Middlesbrough were most commonly associated with the Dave Clark Five song. Of course, it was uh, it was Palish. Uh, Metropolitan United. We all seem to get one answer that it's the same by uh, both players that do this. And it was the same answer that uh, Ollie Robinson gave. Uh, name a club who plays their home games at Wembley. West Ham, not quite a uh, great answer though. Ronaldo, of course, it was Beckham with the aftershave. And Middlesbrough versus Sunderland, most definitely not. Uh, a London derby so all in all good night for you hopefully it will be a great season this year we wish you every success for the rest of the season and thanks ever so much Danny for coming on no problem thank you very much Danny Bracken there playing uh, Super Sub don't forget if you're a player and uh, you want to get on to Super Sub uh, you can get in touch with us uh, <coughs> by emailing or on social media it's official BOTN all the details on the website back of the net south, uh, co uk. Right, let's get back to tonight's uh, topic. We're going to preview some of the games at the weekend and, of course, the Bostic League show before uh, the end of tonight's show. Uh, we were talking all about social media in the game. Some great thoughts on this. We were trying to talk about the positives uh, that social media uh, brings to the game. And, Jody, we were mentioning uh, the profiles of clubs and how it can raise their profile. You went for a really good cup run this year. Of course, a fantastic uh, tie that you got yourself at the end of the FA Cup run. How did social media help that and get the fans engaged? Uh, it's, it's something we've concentrated on since about 18 months ago and our gates have gone up by 85%, I think, in the last eight, uh, 18 months. So a, l a large part of it has been through social media, um, trying to engage the younger people in the community. Our crowd was quite an uh, elderly sort of crowd, a lot of people's pensioners, really and we realised the long-term future, we had to engage the younger people. So that's why we hit the social media. Um, now we probably have 70 to 80 kids in there every game, and, and they're the ones behind the goal singing and chanting, getting the boys' autographs. And I think, I, you know, that's been a massive positive for our football club, uh, regardless of the FA Cup run. I think the FA Cup run gave, gave it separate exposure. Um, but social media itself was a real tool for us to engage the young people, the local schools, young families, our own youth teams within our club because we follow them and they follow us back and you know share results on there and stuff like that. And it's been a real positive for the football club. And we talked a little bit, Mark, about how that it gauges with local fans. The, the importance of getting it right, though, when you put on social media, it's almost gospel for every club now when we look across their social media accounts right the way from the Premier League down. So it's important that you get someone to run social media who can do it right. Um, well, obviously, um, I've got a social media uh, company, so I can speak um, passionately about it. But it, I mean, I don't know if there's any kind of training involved now or available for, you know, commercial guys in football clubs, but there kind of should be. There's, there's, there's an awful lot to it. What you should tweet, when you should tweet it, great times to tweet, great times not to tweet, you know, um, if you want to target certain audiences. So it's definitely an art form, that's for sure. Um, you can't clog up. Uh, people's timelines with information that's not engaging you've got to get the right thing at the right time so I mean anyone out there who's running a social media account for you know for a football club would do well to uh, find a really well run one and then just have a little look at what they do and try and emulate some of what they do there's, there's some really good ones out there Harry, as a manager, obviously you've said tonight that you're not particularly want someone who would use social media a lot. Do you have any real involvement and pay any attention to what the club does? Yeah, yeah, no, a lot. No, um, I use it in terms of, you know, after a game, I always thank the fans and it's a way of getting to them. As we do, we walk, you know, we walk up to them at the end of the game anywhere, but it's another way of sort of showing your appreciation and uh, write a little comment about, about the game afterwards as I've been asked to by our social media team which is fine but you know I don't reply to anything else afterwards I don't look at anything that's commented on my comments um, but yeah no fully aware of what they do they do a good job and it's it's a, um, it's a as I said it's a great tool in, in a way for clubs it's a great tool to use there's a great aspect to it 
Um, the, the bit Mark said about training for people would be brilliant. Um, but there's another side to it. You know, you get some, you get some uh, clubs that use it and they almost comment like fans. And, then, and it, uh, to me, it's, all it does is degrade them straight away as a club, you know. You get fans or a press officer at the club or a program editor that suddenly wants to write something, you know, about <laughs> this club and about yourselves. And, uh, you know, I think you've got to be as, as sort of uh, unopinionated as you can as, as someone that's running a social media for a team to come across, you know, as professional as you can because, you know, you emulate, like you said, you look at people, you emulate the top level. I don't think you get any sort of really teams at the top level, you know, commenting on other teams and, and fans and what they think of another club. One of the, the best things is when a club, and certainly see this at the top level, when they interact with another club, sometimes it's a joke, sometimes it's something's happened and they feel like they can interact. I think fans like to see that. But as you said, Harry, it's important that you, you, you don't have a swipe at a, another team. And, and, and certainly if you go down the leagues, I think it maybe into combined counties, you do see examples of um, perhaps clubs that use it in a way to react after games to, towards certain decisions and things that have happened yeah I mean like I say I mean Harry's spot on it's just uh, it's really I mean it's a common sense perspective that that's not the way to use it but equally in some cases it could just be an uneducated um, understanding of how best to use it I'd like to see the FA putting all their money all their you know ample amounts of money they collect from everybody into providing you know, training courses for the type, this type of stuff. It benefits all and sundry to, you know, grow attendances, grow sponsorship and revenues into non-league football. And I'm sure it'd be one of the most attended training courses out there if there was stuff available uh, for, the, for these guys involved in clubs. When we talk about fan engagement as well, moving away perhaps from social media, an example being the game we were at when you played uh, Leatherhead in the Cup. And afterwards, you had to do interviews for BT Sport. You did an interview for us here at Back of the Net as well. You did an interview for the radio. You did an interview for your club TV. As a manager, is that something you just have to accept now that it's, it's part of fan experience and fan engagement that you will have to, even after a defeat like that, come out and do four or five different interviews saying the same thing? It's part and parcel of it. It's a great, you've got to look at it and think it's a great experience for yourself and uh, controlling your own emotions. Controlling, you know, you can't, you can't tell me, you know, after a, a sort of a game like that, you know, everything I say, there's a lot more I'd want to say probably, um, but there's a lot you don't and it's about learning to control it and all you can try and do is use the experience, but it's very much pass, part and parcel with it now. Um, a bit of Ricky, it's probably the most it's been. Again, last night, BT and uh, BBC, it's, it's a little bit more, but you can only embrace it um, and learn from it and you read back and assess yourself as you do with players, you tell them to watch themselves and, you know, watch back things and assess themselves. You've got to do the same. So that's one thing I do do. I do listen back to interviews and go, you know, shouldn't have said that, probably should be more clear on this. And you learn as you go along. And it's, it's a great for, I think, all managers to sort of self-analyse, really. And it probably gives you a clearer way of sort of uh, looking at the game, you know, in a more, more uh, sort of unopinionated manner. And, for, and so important for fans to be able to engage with clubs, to feel close to the players, close to the managers, that, that managers do these interviews. I've got to say, uh, yeah, there's so much, there's so much more that can be given. We get not complaints, f feedback. We've got good supporters, and um, but the feedback we get commonly is, no, we love it when you do your your live thing because we don't always know why someone's not playing or why someone's on the bench, and sometimes it's easily forgotten. You know that he's been carrying a small knock, or you know that he picked a certain team for a certain way, but your supporters often don't, and. I think one th one thing we're looking to try and improve upon definitely is being able to give more uh, information, engage with them with uh, the kind of team selection and, and things like that, you know, that's for sure. So it's feedback we get all the time. And maybe in non-league we forget, you, you know, the likes of Manchester United, people will log on and watch Jose Mourinho's pre-match, post-match. Well, no matter how many supporters you have at a non-league football club, those fans will still want to see interviews with the manager before and after the games. I think they deserve to. I think some of the fans, the way they travel, you know, and come into all these games and play, you know, the only time I probably have ever replied on social media, I think is when someone, you know, if there's a genuine reason why someone's not been around and a, a fan wants to know and it's something that's not private, uh, you know, it's sometimes, you know, he's, he's come all this way, wherever it's been, you know, low stuff, then he wants to know why he's not playing, he's come all that way. I'm happy if it's not a private matter, it's just to let him know, there's no reason, it's not a secret sort of thing and it's, it's uh, at the top level you get it all you know you know a team for a game you know five hours before on social media and stuff and it's good to give your fans as much respect as you can to sort of you know they earn their right sometimes to have some info on the team There was a real famous story uh, about Queen's Park Rangers and I'm struggling now to remember the, the name of the, the manager um, 
but the, the the story was that he a fan wanted to talk about why the team were doing so badly came down to the ground and he actually just said yeah let them in cup of tea sit down in the office and I'll, I'll go through it with them and listen to their thoughts which I thought was a brilliant story you get a lot more credit from that I think you'd get you know uh, you, you probably get them off your back a little bit at times you know maybe might work in your favour but sometimes there's things you can't discuss and you know for, for different reasons so there's probably pros and cons to it Ian Holloway I think it was most likely yeah that, that <laughs> did that I thought it was would you ever do that Mark Jody sit down and, and, and talk to a fan with a cup of tea and a Costa maybe in non-league football, you you have to do it, don't you? Because we don't have like a players' lounge at Haybridge. You you go in the bar where the fans are, and if you lose, they don't look at you and don't speak to you, and they speak out loud so that you can hear them because they want to get your interaction that way. If you win, they want to stand with you, chat to you, and and discuss the team. So we, you do it every game. You do it every game. You end up speaking to various supporters, committee members. Um, so I think it is definitely part of non-league football. It's, it's not so much part of professional football because, as you as you said, that's done by the professional media outlets and, and the fans get to see it on the television. Yeah, I mean, so you said to speak to spectators all the time and supporters before the game. And uh, I think, that, like I said, the, the more that they're part of the journey and understand what's behind the club and the management team and, you know, the more you kind of, you don't get them complaints. Uh, I noticed that the clubs... Um, the clubs that uh, that struggle with a lot of negativity uh, tend to be the ones with the the fans that have been around there twenty years, and you know they've still got an extra grind with the chairman from fourteen years ago. And because of that, Harry Wheeler's getting it a bit of Ricky, you know, today. <laughs> but that is you do see a lot of that, you know, a lot of that. And um, you know, obviously these people have got a responsibility themselves to understand the objectives of the club now, but also the club's got to, um, you know. Um, need to take the, these people with them on the journey you know through communicating in what's going on and Mick in, in your time management have you been involved in many discussions with perhaps disgruntled fans happy fans after the game in the bar loads absolutely right Mark loads <laughs> you know I think, I think I'm quite an approachable guy so uh, I've always been in the bar and I'll answer any question anyone would have put to me probably over approachable and probably got myself in many a trouble speaking about things because, you know, I love engaging. That's what I love about it all. One of, the, one of the most brilliant things, I think, about football is that everyone has an opinion on tactics and where players should be playing and positions and styles of play. Is that something as managers that you're happy to accept that it is an opinionated game sometimes and people might have other ideas? I wouldn't say happy. I think you have to accept um, everyone's going to be having opinions, but you, you know, you'll get frustrations when there's people commenting on stuff and they probably don't know the actual reason for it or why, or you know, if there's things out of your hands and circumstances, and they're still commenting, and you want to go back, but you know, you probably can't because it's not a matter to discuss. Um, but you've got to accept it, haven't you? It is what it is. I mean, that's a great example, actually, and, and I'll just say how it is at Lowestoft. Actually, we're up at Lowestoft, and you know, uh, look at their forum, actually going back to your point before, boys, about their forum being used negativity. You know, the poor guys at Lowestoft, I mean, you know, their supporters are purely judging them from when they're in the conference north and flying. And anything anything less than winning every game and they're getting pelters from their crowd. So that's what I mean about the kind of, you know, the legacy supporters that even if the young managers in there giving the kids a chance, etc., like the guy was at last off, some great young players, you know, he's still got a tough job. Uh, you know, so, you know, that's a kind of living example we've seen this year. And, and almost brings us back to our point was Harry and Mark were making there that if you go on social media and you um, do engage with fans, fan engagement, then perhaps there'll be a little bit uh, more understanding. We could go on with this topic uh, forever. We've run out of time uh, talking about that. You can get your thoughts in on social media. Though. It's official BOTN if you want to let us know how you feel about your club and fan engagement. Right now, we're going to preview some of the fixtures at the weekend. Plenty going on across the Bostick Leagues. And we're going to start with Enfield against King Kingstonian. It's 16th versus 17th. Enfield hosts Kingstonian, Kingstonian on Saturday. Uh, Enfield uh, are one point advantage uh, over Kingstonian. They're on a poor run of form, losing four of their last five games and drawing one. The hosts are without a win in seven games, but a victory on Saturday will propel them up the table. They're level um, on points with Dorking Wanderers and could reach as high as 13th if they secure three points against the Ks. Kingstonian on a mixed run of form, losing three and winning two of their last five. In uh, recent news, Enfield have signed two attacking players, striker Brad Watkins and midfielder Tyler Campbell uh, for Kingstonian. Lee Dynam announced the signing of Nick Cardini earlier this week and hopes to secure some more loan signings over the coming weeks. Really 
big game in the middle of the table towards the bottom. Two sides that you perhaps could say, Mick, would be expecting. We talk about supporters and fan expectations. Two teams that would be expecting to do a lot better than they are. I feel a little bit for Andy Lee. to be fair. He come into uh, infield to start the season, having to rebuild a whole new team when their manager left and took over Braintree. And uh, <coughs> they had a reasonable start. But he has tried to build a whole new team and that club has big expectations as they've been sort of uh, up in the playoff spots in the last year or so. And um, they fell away a little bit, so I feel a little bit for him. As for Lee, obviously I know Lee really well and, um, you know, he's had to, again, another manager come in that's had to part of the way into the season which is even more difficult and try and rebuild a team. He thought maybe some players would hack it and they didn't turn out to be that way. He's now got a team actually that he thinks is going to perform to the end of the season and he's going to have them all signed up ready to go for the start of next year so I'll, well you know I reckon it'll likely be a draw in all honesty all that for a draw yeah I'm sorry but that's it <laughs> interestingly, both. interestingly Andy Lease uh, Mick we were, we were speaking to him uh, when we covered them and I did say the same thing in an interview afterwards I said you'd probably expect Enfield to be doing a lot better and he did shoot me down straight away and said I've had to change the whole team so I don't know what you're talking about Ben um, but certainly last year and by reputation maybe they'd expect I think, I think they probably you know I, I'll be careful with this well I think they deserve to do better um, Andy Lee does a lot of his own work works hard behind the scenes does a lot always got information on teams watching which credit a lot of managers do there's some that don't you know and for his efforts I think he's a uh, they built quite a good side and Brad Watkins is a very good signing for them. Good player. Um, the same with Kingstonian, they put a lot of effort in, as all managers do, there's no disrespect to that, but at the same time, you know, um, they've both, they're both got a lot of potential, I find, and they've both got some good players in those sides and, you know, uh, either of them are capable of going on a run. I, ju I just, I think nearly every non-league team rebuilds in the summer, don't they? It's, it's quite rare that you'll see a team good carry point. over with the same, they're, they're the sides that do really well but I don't really think you can use it as an excuse in February that you had to rebuild the team in July. There we go. Our thoughts on that, Andy. Uh, <laughs> let us know what you think. Another <laughs> game in the Bostick Premier Division uh, involves Harry Met Police uh, take on Billericay Town. Billericay looking to extend their lead at the top of the table uh, away from the likes of Dulwich and Margate. And of course, Met Police, as we talked about earlier, uh, in fine uh, form as well. This is a big game away at Met Police yeah tough game um, it'd be, we only played them I said showed you earlier I think it was three weeks ago I think I said two times about three weeks ago and um, they had a really disruptive journey I think they got their kick off to late to wait um, so they were about half hour before in the end and uh, I think it rocked them a little bit so we'll be expecting uh, a tough test uh, they are a good side got some good players um, and we take literally nothing for granted we don't deserve to take anything for granted you know, we don't have a divine right no one has and we'll go into it and do our homework and Expect expect a tough match, and you know we'll uh, we'll have to again we have to be at our best, and because um, we know what they are great 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 manager, uh, really nice guy, good 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 sort of uh, balance through their side, and it'll be a, it'll be a tough game. I mean, we saw Met Police recently, very well organised defensively. I think Jim plays mind games all the time. I remember interviewing him not too long ago, saying that we're going to plummet down the table, and they've got the least, the worst budget in the league. So that mind game has definitely, definitely worked in his favour because they, I don't think they've lost since, or they've gone on a fantastic run. I just look at them and Wingate and think two unfancied sides. Just you know, I know Wingate might say where they were up the top last the previous season that, but I just think they're sort of two teams you wouldn't naturally say should be in that top um, five, and they have so fantastic. Both you know, hats off to both those managers. Yeah, ten points in their last six games for Met Police. So they're, you know, they're looking to, as you say, in eighth position at the moment. Can they make their way into the playoffs? Four points off Staines in the playoffs. There's certain, ma there's certain managers in the league that, uh, that have got the ability to you know, do a job on another team. And, and Jim's one of those. He's been around. Would he be the longest serving second to Neil Cugley at Folkestone? Probably, but, um, you know, he, he, Jim's got the ability to, you know, uh, to put a winning performance in at any given moment. So... Be tough for Billy Wiggy. and obviously I guess all the neutrals. I mean, personally, I'd like, I'd like to see Billy Wiggy win the league personally because they deserve to. But the neutrals are thinking, right, Billy Wiggy get beaten. Let's see how they react to that 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 league defeat. I think last defeat would have been first game of the Very season. First one, yeah. yeah. Um, same after Leverett game. Everyone thought, right, is this going to be the start? And you know, we won the next six, and it was. I think the thing with us is that. Um, because some people say oh well the players they might you know fancy themselves it's actually the opposite because there's such competition they know if they don't perform you're not playing 
and we make it very very clear if you don't perform today we've got the capability to drop your next game it's no divine right you know we feel that the the 20 in the squad are as good as each other and we have no issue with dropping someone if they don't perform so there's almost there's no chance for a complacency anywhere through that side and they know that if you want to play football you're going to have to perform so it kind of eradicates the complacency side of it and of course um, people always look for that one and we make it very clear to them that you know we expect reactions quickly whenever things aren't going your way and they haven't always in terms of the beginning of games and we've been behind um, and they've showed that they've got that still side and not sort of they don't feel there is a divine right to win Plenty of intriguing action in the Bostick Premier Division uh, this weekend. Into the Bostick North, Greys Athletic take on Molden and Tiptree this weekend. In 11th, Greys are winless in their last three games and are certainly on mixed form with three draws, one loss and one win in their last five. Uh, the visitors, Molden and Tiptree, are in sixth in the Bostick North and they've also had a mixed uh, last bag of results. Uh, two wins and three losses, although 12 points separate uh, these two sides. Their recent uh, turbulence in form means this game could really go either way. You know both these sides well. And again, it's um, Molden and Tiptree you're chasing promotion. Yeah. Um, Molden have recruited very well in the last couple of weeks. Um, they've got uh, unbelievable capacity to attract players from higher divisions. Um, so they'll go into the game probably as favourites. They've they've shown their hand. They're very ambitious. They want to get promoted. Uh, Greys have got an outside chance at the last playoff place at the moment. Um, but I would say on the Astro turf, uh, with the way that Malden play, it will suit them on the Astro, and 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 Greys will be hard pushed to get anything from the game. Probably the tie of this round of fixtures, AFC Hornchurch take on Harringay Borough. It's first against seventh. Harringay will be hoping that they can uh, continue their fine form into uh, the playoffs. It's a really big tie for a team in AFC Hornchurch who are almost, we touched on it earlier, running away uh, with the league a little bit. As in the south, it's all very close from first to sixth. It's, Haring it's AFC Hornchurch rather that, that have got that real lead at the top. Um, Hornchurch are a really sort of rigid, well-organised team quite direct physical good on set pieces the, the I've watched them a number of times and the one thing they if they struggle obviously they don't struggle look where they are in the league table but the thing they find harder to play against is mobile teams that pass the ball that can rotate and Haringey are one of the teams in our division that can do that so I think that would be a tricky one for Hornchurch I think Haringey are one of the sides that could could beat Hornchurch on their day so um, I'm going to go for an upset there I'm going to say Haringey are going to beat Hornchurch yeah, Haringey have got seven points from their last six games, so they'll need to do a little bit better if they're going to get anything off the leaders, AFC Hornchurch. Moving in to the Bostic South, uh, Lewis take on Carshalton and a massive game at the top of that table, a tight clash um, between Lewis and Carshalton. This promotion battle, only three points separate the teams. A win for Carshalton, however, uh, will put them in second uh, if second place Cray Wanderers lose uh, due to a smaller, smaller goal difference uh, following a 2-1 defeat to Horsham on New Year's Day. Lewis have quickly recovered and are unbeaten in every game since with three wins and two draws in their last five. Uh, the side can take plenty of confidence going into this game. Uh, Carshalton, however, can't be ruled out. The visitors are unbeaten in eight league games and have won four of their last five matches drawing one Mick we mentioned the, the tightness of the Bostick South all the way from first to sixth anyone could win uh, that league and this is another massive game for Lewis but they do usually come out on top when the big games happen they do and I was at the um, reverse game at a few weeks ago when Carl Shorten were at home to Lewis and uh, they beat uh, Lewis on that night fantastic game of football were you there Mark I'm wondering whether you were there but it was a really good game of football obviously they deserve to be where they are both those sides and um, you know being on, on the grass well is it Lewis at home aren't they so they're on the grass so I, I reckon that would be in the favour of Lewis and I think Lewis would want to turn uh, Carl Shorten over but two two good footballing sides and um, I, I suspect that would be a really good game whoever's going to go there and watch that on Saturday It's a bit different Mark to the, the league last year where there were two clear runaway teams and the rest in the playoffs we mentioned it earlier but everyone in that 1-6 to six will be thinking right now we can still win the league Well the motivation everybody had this year with the additional promotions that, 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 you know, that's, uh, that's um, heightened clubs ambitions uh, which is why you've got so many clubs having a go there's nothing worse than this one up 
situation, which we spoke about before, where it can be done by Christmas in, in any league. Um, but listen, I'll tell you what I would say. that I think there's a change of the guard coming, my prediction, in, in the south. I think, um, I know Lewis run beat and a couple of draws in there. The chasing pack are going 10 to the dozen. That's the issue here. It's not so much the top two or Lewis being unbeaten. It's the fact that the likes of Greenwich, Carl Shorten and Walton are flying. And they've, they've caught up themselves probably eight, nine points deficit in, in a couple of three weeks. And uh, there's nothing in it now. And no doubt they're all playing each other, etc. as well. So, you know, for me, you could make a call for anyone in that top five, uh, to, uh, top six rather, to, to win that league and get promoted. But I do think no one else will sneak in there this year. I think that's it. I don't think, I think that anyone else will get in that group. And you mentioned Walton Casuals, and that means uh, it's the final part of our show. We just talk about the Bostick League show on Saturday. And it is sitting born against Walton Casuals for us on Saturday. The Bostick League show at 10 o'clock Sunday morning, of course, feature games uh, from across, across the Premier Division. But we turn our attention to the Bostick South uh, for our featured game. And uh, sitting born would say that they're obviously uh, playoff contenders as well. Uh, they were earlier on in the season. They've slipped massively down the table in 15th now and uh, they've made a change. Interim sitting ball manager will be Aslan Odiev. Uh, he takes charge after the resignation of former boss uh, Nick Davis. Uh, Mick, we, we mentioned sitting born earlier as real playoff contenders and the, the demise has been incredible. Well, obviously, <laughs> there's been issues for the last few weeks there, I think. I could tell when I was speaking to Nick a few weeks back. And, uh, you know, he deserves to um, hopefully another club will pick him up and he'll go somewhere because he's done exceptionally well at Sittingbourne for the last few years on a, a meagre budget, I would have thought. I was, I was told that he had to take a 20% budget cut and that was probably pushed him over the edge to go uh, and I mean there's obviously negative talk from them saying they were trying to get rid of him but um, you know Warren Casuals my old club as well Anthony Gale there I'm looking forward to that game on Saturday it'd be interesting to see whether Sitting Bourne can pick themselves up with their new manager in tow and I'll be interested to see how good Warren Casuals are because I ain't seen them for a little bit obviously Mark's obviously kept an eye on them and that but they are flying so that should be interesting yeah, they're unbeaten in their last five matches, winning four of them. They're just three points off of automatic spot. A real big game for them on Saturday. Uh, this time, uh, when the fixture was played reverse, they went out 3-0 winners. And Josh Kelly, definitely worth a mention as well, been on great form. He's netted 21 times uh, this season for Wharton Casuals. Real opportunity for in a new ground as well. Seven-day approach. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I think uh, a way win for me. Uh, and... Um, I think Walton this year, uh, you know, having a great season, new ground, etc. And yeah, to to mix point, uh, Nick going and uh, make a, have a big impact. Um, obviously, the only you know thing is, uh, as Billy Ricky are going to find out this year when they go places like our place, is that that venue at Sitting Bull <laughs> would be a leveller. Um, so, um, coming off a three G with lots of young, good footballing players, that Anthony will be conscious about the venue. So much good football across the leagues at the weekend. Uh, do let us know which game you're going to official BOTM. We'll continue the debate uh, on social media. That's it for us tonight. Plenty to look forward to, as we said. The Bostick League show from Sittingbourne against Walton Casuals will be available Sunday. And of course, if you missed any of tonight's show, uh, you can subscribe on iTunes. Just search Back of the Net and download the podcast. The best bits of the debate tonight. My thanks uh, to Harry, Jody, uh, Mick and Mark uh, for their company this evening and uh, we will see you next week same time 7 o'clock For the best highlights from across the Bostick Leagues visit youtube.com forward slash back of the net